All right, good good afternoon everyone and welcome to the May 19th, 2021 redevelopment authority uh, for the city of Oshkosh. Uh, this is also a, a joint invitation for our city council members. Uh, I see uh, we may have one and a number of guests this this afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to take the roll. Pence. Here. Stam. Here. Lasky. Here. Connick. Belter. Belter. Here. And Paul Mary. Here. All right, we do have a quorum and also uh, I see that we have uh, someone who is dialed in uh, with the phone number ending in 99. Uh, if you could identify yourself. Do we have someone dialed in to attend the meeting? All right, we will move on then to approval of minutes for March 17th, 2021. Looks like a motion from Tom Belter. Do we have a second? All right, Jason Lasky. And uh, I see that um, Suponic has joined us. And we are at uh, authorization of the March 17th minutes, so, so any discussion on those minutes or corrections? All right, please call the roll. Hints. Sam. Aye. Lasky? Aye. Connick? Here. Belter? Belter? I think you're muted, oh, Tom. I got you muted. Uh, I did this. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Mary? Aye. All right, very good then. Um, I just wanna make a note here also that uh, we did receive a correspondence from a Mr. Pollock uh, regarding the upcoming presentations of uh, development proposals uh, in the Sawdust District. And uh, Mr. Pollock was just um, referencing a desire uh, to see some condo opportunities. So just uh, to record that. Uh, next, we have a public hearing 21-07 approve spot blight designation, approve acquisition of property at 512 Otter Avenue, $30,000. Do we have anyone registered to speak or in attendance that wishes to speak on that item? A second call for public comment on public hearing 2107 on spot blight designation for 512 Otter. And a third and final call for any public comment for 2107 public hearing. All right. Can we have a motion and a second? So moved. Okay, motion made by Panic. Do we have a second? I'll second. <laughs> All right. Any discussion on uh, approving the spotlight designation for 512 Otter and acquisition of the property? Was, was that a new fund we found? I never heard of that before. Scattered sites, correct? 
Yes, that is scattered sites and that's something the council just created this last year. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Is there a lot of money in it? Uh, I don't remember the budget, but it's at least it's in the $400,000 range. Okay. Good. Thank you. And um, I'll ask you to uh, give me an audio, audible signal here because the screen is being shared. If anybody would like to discuss this, I only see three of you. So if you would like to discuss this, uh, just jump right in here. All right. Alan, since we're only seeing a little bit of the screen here, can you just give me a reference point? I can't really read the street that's yep. intersecting. Uh, that's broad in the railroad tracks and Otter. So it's three houses away from the railroad crossing on Otter. Okay. Okay. All right. If we have no further discussion, we'll call the roll on public hearing 2107. Pence. Aye. Stam. Aye. Lasky. Aye. Connick. Aye. Belter. Aye. And Palmieri. Aye. Our next item is 2108 authorized land disposition of 548 Otter Avenue, $11,000. Is there anyone here registered to speak or would like to speak to this item? We'll take a motion and a second. So moved. Second. A second. All right. Um, I didn't see that. Uh, were you able to record that, Anna? Yep, I got it. Yeah, if you could just share your name, um, since we're not able to see the full screen and, and identify who's making the motion and the second, appreciate it. All right, uh, discussion. Sue, I see your hand flashing in the screen, oh. but I don't know if it's raised. I'm sorry, it's not. Um, okay. Just have my elbow up. Um, Mr. Davis, uh, uh, could you just give a brief summary on this uh, land disposition, please? Yes, if you recall, the RDA recently acquired the property and is the process of demolishing the blighted structure. Uh, the property owner to the north approached city staff to buy the uh, vacant lot once the structure is demolished, and that would restore the lot to its original shape and size. Uh, and since it was purchased with CDBG funds, he will be purchasing it for fair market value, which is $11,000. All right, very good. Any further discussion? Where does that money go back into? Back into the community development block grant program to be used as program income and then repurposed for housing rehabilitation or other uh, projects that would come before. Uh, it could even be used for blight removal again. Thank you. All right, if we have no further discussion, please call the roll on 2108. Hence. Aye. Stam. Aye. Lasky. Aye. Ponick. Aye. Belter. Aye. Palmieri. Aye. All right, item number five uh, is regarding the upcoming uh, workshop joint subdivision code updates and affordable housing jointly with the common council redevelopment authority sustainability advisory board advisory parks board and plan commission which is proposed for june 10th at 6 p.m and uh, due to the number of folks that we expect for that it will be virtual is there anything else to add to that alan No, you should be receiving an invitation for the virtual meeting in the near future. And uh, are we anticipating some materials coming along with that ahead of time? Yes, we are. Uh, staff is working on that as we speak, and we've drafted that out, and we're trying to put the finishing touches on it here before Memorial Day so we can get it out in early June. Thanks, sir. 
All right, uh, next item virtual or in person meeting. So, um, some of you may know that uh, beginning well, actually next Tuesday, the council will be reconvening in person and um, had originally, uh, or I'm sorry, at the last council meeting uh, determined it would be up to each border commission what their preference is going forward. The only option that's kind of off the table, I guess, is hybrid. So it's kind of an all or nothing here and uh, wanted to bring this um, for uh, discussion and decision with this with this commission. Lori, uh, this is Steve Hintz. Um, yes. I would prefer in person, and I trust that my uh, fellow committee members are either vaccinated or they will uh, stand back against the wall away from everybody else. All right, Mr. Hint, Mr. Hintz is suggesting uh, in person. I'm Suponic, I'm fine with in person. Uh, so do you folks want to make a motion on uh, returning to in person commencing with our next meeting or when would you like to do that? Well, I see that the meeting on June 10th is virtual. And our next meeting would be when? June 16th. Uh, what was that, Mr. Davis? Uh, June 16th is the date that uh, everybody we could attend for a special meeting in June, oh, June 16th. So I'll move that we attend the next meeting, which would be the special meeting on June 16th in person. All right. And, and all future meetings, so? And all future meetings. I'll second it. All right, seconded by Belter. Any further discussion on returning in person June starting June 16th? All right, please take the roll. Hence. Aye. Stan. Mr. Sam, are you muted? Yeah, I. Lasky? Aye. Connick? Aye. Belter? Aye. Palmieri? Aye. All right, next we have our executive director's report, Mr. Davis. Thank you. Uh, I've written everything down for your uh, edification, and I'd be happy to answer any questions since we have several people waiting to make presentations. I wouldn't don't necessarily need to go over every paragraph, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and then wanted to point out that that June 16th meeting, uh, it'll be a special meeting to select the 43 7th and a new item, the American Rescue Plan Act uh, projects that the RDA would want to recommend to council for potential funding. So two big things to talk about on June 16th. Alan, could you please repeat the first part of it? It came in garbled for me. I apologize. Uh, June 16th special meeting of the RDA to select the 43 East 7th proposal. You're hearing those presentations tonight. I expect we'll also have an opportunity for citizen input there at June 16th. And then the second half would be the American Rescue Plan Act project recommendations to council. Any other questions about the June 16th special meeting? All right. We'll take a motion to adjourn. Ms. Palmer, and, Ms. Palmer, yes. before we adjourn, could I just uh, take a minute to acknowledge uh, Darlene Brandt? Darlene Brandt has been a longtime employee of the city, and this is her last RDA meeting, and she has spent countless hours, and the results speak for themselves. She's been instrumental in creating the Riverwalk, remediating sites, demolishing blight, 
helping with re housing rehabilitation and working with all our partners to achieve our community wide goals. And I can't thank her enough for all the work she's put into uh, making the city of Oshkosh a better place. So this was my little opportunity to remind the RDA of all the efforts that she's gone to help you guys achieve your ends. So thank you, Ms. Brandt. Thank you. I did not Sorry. see her on the screen. I'm so sorry. I missed that. She's the one on the beach. Ah, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Brandt, for um, all your service and assistance and facilitation. Thank you, Mr. Davis, and thank you, Mayor Palmieri. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you. Good job, Marilyn. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting so we can begin the so workshop? moved? Second. All right, Mr. Belter and Mr. Sam seconds. And please take the roll. Hints? Aye. Sam? Aye. Baskey? Aye. Aye. Connick? Aye. Belter? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. All right, we are adjourned uh, from the RDA meeting, and we will now call the roll for the joint workshop. Hints? Here. Stam? Here. Lasky? Here. Connick? Here. Belter? Here. Palmieri? Here. Hansen? Miller? Wojciechowski? Here. Erickson? Ford? Here. And Mugerauer? All right, thank you for the roll. Uh, so this workshop is for the purposes of uh, reviewing and we have five presentations, I'm sorry, five presentations and then RDA discussion and direction to staff. Um, each of the presentations is anticipated to be 10 minutes um, plus uh, or minus with the Q&A in addition. And I, I would ask um, Anna or Mr. Davis, do we have a list of who is in attendance for each of the presentations or the, the presenters' names? I have the company names. Uh, that I would have to defer to uh, Ms. Nyforth. Uh, Kelly Nyforth is our Economic Development Services Manager, and she's been working with all the proposers to put their uh digital presentations together and make them viewable for everybody uh i will be pleasantly surprised if it all works so keep your expectations low uh, but ms nyforth has been instrumental in putting this together and ms nyforth uh can you maybe make the introductions as to who the representatives are for at least the first one t wall enterprises llc Sure. Well, if, if something goes wrong, we all know it's Alan's folks. He just jinxed us. So thanks, Alan. <laughs> yes, up first, we do have T Wall Enterprises. And uh, today we have um, Mr. Jake Bunce. He is a uh, representative of T Wall. And um, Jake, do you have any of anybody else with you today? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jake Bunce with T Wall Enterprises. I'm here with uh, Maddie Wall. You can see her, and then uh, Terrence Wall as well. And uh, with that, we'd like to present to you guys uh, the Mill on Main, our T-Wall Enterprises response to this RFP. And I'll let uh, Terrence here take it away. Okay. So uh, thank you for having us tonight. Um, I just want to say, first of all, that we specialize in exactly this kind of redevelopment of urban industrial areas being redeveloped uh, in downtowns or city centers on the water. Um, we've done this in a number of cities and uh, has been the catalyst for 
uh, other development in the area as well. Um, I think the key is really creating an activity center and activating the street, uh, making Riverwalk the priority rather than the development the priority. Um, we always like to look at the benefit of the development to the overall community, uh, bringing people into the area, um, activating the riverfront, and you know, being an enhancement and a complement to the riverfront rather than dominating it. Um, and it's all about getting heads and beds, you know, getting people there to uh, live there, patronize the restaurants, the retail, the shops, et cetera. Uh, that, of course, means density. Um, but then, you know, having the amenities. And I think that Riverwalk is a huge amenity uh, for our development, but also for the public. And it really has to be worked together and be complementary. Um, so we've put our buildings back from the water. Uh, we've created a tremendous amount of green space, uh, front yard up to the Riverwalk green space. Uh, we had originally proposed uh, a, a small low-lying fence, but we pulled that back um, away from the water, way back into the development. Um, and we've uh, proposed having three separate buildings in three phases. Um, you know, for example, we've even put a, uh, a little bit of a, a, a restaurant on the water uh, in one of our buildings. You know, that could have like a ice cream soda fountain window where people could grab a water bottle or a soda or an ice cream or something when they're biking or hiking or walking along the river walk. Um, so it's all about interacting and, and having the two work together and not dominating uh, the riverfront. Um, next slide. Oh, you might have to jump in. Next slide. Or are you able to? There we go. There we go. Yeah, so remind me if I miss. Yeah. Um, or can we back up one? I just want to point out something else. So. Sorry. Can we back? There we go. Um, so we've, we've also made our uh, open space and our amenity package uh, as part of the, it's just seamless into the river walk, you know, make it one area. <clears throat> we propose an amphitheater so there could be, you know, movie night or a band or, you know, some kind of program and activity. We would program that and, and, and bring in activities. Um, we've got a shared parking lot down there in the lower right corner uh, for your trailheads. You've got some extra parking, you know, that'd be on a private property, but uh, for the trailhead, we could have a shared parking easement. Uh, to the south of that, you can see uh, the dog park. Uh, we took that and we thought, what a great opportunity. Um, we love to have pets in our buildings, uh, but that could be a public dog park. I mean, we would, we can maintain as private property and, and uh, you know, take care of it, uh, but we could certainly make it open to the public. Um, and there's a trailhead there so people could park there if they wanted and then take their dog out of their car and walk over to the dog park. Um, you know, it's also, we had very little surface parking. Almost all of our parking is underground. Um, under the buildings, our surface parking through a grand entrance is really to cover the needs of the retail and the restaurants. Uh, you know, it's important to have enough parking for them. We want to maintain the street parking and keep the street active. Um, you know, those retailers are going to need a place for their customers to park, uh, including, you know, food service, et cetera. Uh, but we didn't want the site to be dominated by asphalt and concrete. You know, we love our sites to be dominated by green space, amenities. Uh, we've got some pickleball carts there. We've got a pool and clubhouse, um, you know, outdoor seating area to activate the riverfront again for the restaurant. That could be a brew pub or something like that. Uh, so it's just all about the interaction and the connection and bringing it all together. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Um, so we can go, to, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so we're proposing up to about 300 units. Again, it's about density. You want to get enough people there, uh, living there to support uh, the retail and the restaurants, et cetera. Um, this will be built in three phases. Uh, four-story buildings uh, with underground parking. Um, we have the highest quality developments in, in the Midwest, if not the state of Wisconsin. Um, our hallways are wider. Our buildings have one foot extra height in every floor. Um, our garages are very bright and very light. They're, we paint them white and yellow um, so that when you go in there, it's very bright and open and airy. Um, we put in extra features, we put in electric charging stations, we put in bicycle storage that's inside and heated. Um, we'll do solar panels uh, on our buildings. Uh, we put in ice makers, which other developers don't do. So all the highest quality, the construction is very high quality. We insulate every wall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So it's just way beyond what happens with most buildings. Uh, next slide. I apologize for I'm going too fast, but I'm trying to stay within your time limits. Uh, we're proposing about 19,000 square feet of retail and restaurant space, um, and we'll be careful to choose who those are. You know, you want to get the right kind of tenant. Uh, you don't want to say necessarily get a you know a subway store. You know that can go anywhere. We want to get cutesy, quaint businesses that are going to attract people to downtown and to this area, the Saw District. District. Next slide. Uh, keep going. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll just keep going. Next slide. So keep this on your time limit. Um, our schedule, uh, we'd like to break ground as soon as possible. Um, realistically, I think that's probably October of next year. If it's, if it's sooner and we have all our approvals and our building permit in place, we'll break ground sooner. Um, it's all about how long it takes to get the approvals through and how long it takes to get the state building permit. Um, but we're, you know, we're ready to go as soon as the city's ready to go. Uh, next slide. Actually, you can skip the next two slides. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, this is Middleton Center, uh, downtown Middleton. We were asked to redevelop downtown Middleton. We bought six buildings. We demoed them. Uh, we built three phases between three, four, and five stories uh, per phase. Uh, you can see the fourth floor setback. That clock tower, actually, I'm sitting in that clock tower right now. That's our office. Um, that's where we're, <laughs> we're talking to you from. Uh, so we have some office there, but we also have first floor coffee shop, hair salons. We have a men's clothing store, interior uh, furnishings store, uh, a really nice um, beer cafe, restaurant, uh, a fitness center that's operated by a third party. Um, just really cool shops here, uh, a poke bowl, um, a board and brush, you know. Uh, so it's really brought the it's really brought a lot of customers downtown. We do holiday lighting uh, at night on the roof line, the roof edge of the building. Um, it really has become a landmark. It's completely transformed downtown. You know, we're 58 percent of the entire downtown tax base. Uh, we increase the tax base um, according to the prior assessor uh, by I think it was like 10 times. We had a four and a half million dollar assessment value on this property. It'll be over $60 million uh, when we're done. We just opened up phase three um, a week ago. Uh, next slide. And one of the things we noticed that uh, downtown Middleton lacked was an activity center. We didn't want to just have our shops and, you know, and they were typically they would close the street for activities and events and said, hey, you know what, why don't we help the city create something special here? Um, you know, the Capitol Square in Madison, they, that's their activity center, concerts on the square there. Uh, you know, Wednesday nights. Middleton didn't have anything. So we said, let's create something. So I bought uh, four properties across the street. I bulldozed the, the old homes that were being vacated and they were, you know, being reused with different small businesses. And we went to the city, hey, how about we create a town square, you know, for the epicenter of Middleton. And so uh, they embraced it. The planning director here just really went, really did a great job of putting this together. Um, so we uh, sold it to them and donated part of it. Uh, and now they're going to be doing improvements to create uh, a town square with a, uh, you know, kind of a band shell and a fire pit and a sculptures and some neat lighting and, and basically open space to people to use for events. Uh, so it's totally transformed Middleton. Um, we're doing this in Watertown right now. Uh, in our next slide, you'll see where we did this in downtown Green Bay. Our plan in downtown actually attracted Shriver Foods, um, and Shriver Foods developed their headquarters uh, based on us on our plan to remove the old uh, bankrupt uh, regional mall that was downtown, put through the city street, and uh, create a little open space, which you can't see on this. It's on the other side of City Deck, but oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, and then our apartment building, building, City Deck, is right on the lower, lower photograph there. Um, so we developed a, a tall... Uh, multifamily building right on the deck, the city deck itself, which is the activity center. Um, we, you know, the city asks us about what about, you know, we have the 4th of July and other events. Sometimes they close the bridge over the Fox River and they also have bands down on city deck. How do we get 
from the bridge, you know, well, on the 4th of July, you'll see over 100,000 people walk uh, down through our property um, on, a, on a path system we created to link the bridge activities to the city deck activities. Um, and, and that was just instrumental. And then also linking that to the town square that you see there um, that they exist today. Um, so this has been hugely successful. They have 350 events here every year. Um, it's just been amazing to transform downtown Green Bay. Um, and then we're working in, we're working in other communities as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see we wanted to reflect the history of, of Oshkosh and our buildings. Uh, we like to theme our developments or theme our buildings, including we'll, re, you know, we'll get prints, large, you know, three by four foot prints uh, to put inside the, the lobbies and the common areas of the buildings. Um, and, you know, the sawmill, the lumber industry, uh, you know, theme would be one of our buildings. Um, and the architecture of that building would be themed around that. Um, and then a second building could be an aviation theme. You know, you've got the EAA. Um, so that'd be a really cool theme. And then third building would be navigation, which is you have the water, you know, lighthouses, et cetera. Um, and so that would be the third theme. Uh, and so we like to do fun little things around that. You can go to the next slide. Um, and you can, the next slide just clues you in on a few details. You can pull details off of photographs of old buildings uh, to include in, you know, and mimic those in your architecture uh, and really make this an outstanding, uh, just, a, just a dynamic, uh, really interesting community that fits within your overall Riverwalk concept that is attractive to people, you know, empty nesters to sell their homes and move down here, young people, young professionals who want to, who want to move here and because it's exciting, dynamic, um, and you get that mixture of young and old and middle and in between. Um, it's really exciting. Next slide. You know, we could have, um, we like to do a sky deck on our building. So on the top on the roof, there's a, will be a small uh, sky deck room for uh, community, uh, you know, for our residents to use. And we also let uh, community uh, organizations use it um, where they can meet and they can have an event on top of the roof. It's an indoor space and there's usually an outdoor deck on the roof. Um, we could theme, you know, the corner of the aviation building with a, you know, a control tower theme uh, of that sky deck. Um, it's really a neat idea. Next, next slide. Uh, you know, another one, the one with the navigation could be themed around the lighthouse um, with details based on that. Uh, next slide. Uh, we love to look at um, some of the old architecture of, of these types of industrial areas in, in downtowns. And you pull off of that, you know, you pull some of the details, you know, soldier coursing, uh, dentaling, um, you know, awning windows, um, the mullion structure. Uh, you know, all of those little details can be pulled off of some of these photographs, and, and we've incorporated that. So you see on Main Street and in Middleton, uh, you saw all those shops. That was all, that was in primarily in two buildings, but it looked like different storefronts, like different buildings built over different periods of time designed by different architects. But it was really just two buildings, what you saw in the photographs from Middleton Center, because each storefront had a unique look. It looked like it was downtown, small town Wisconsin. You know what I mean? Uh, next slide. We can do some neat things uh, with signage. You know, you could put, uh, you know, you could do a faded uh, sign, you know, for whatever the overall development name would be here. Um, you know, uh, or you could even use the Riverwalk, you know, district name or something uh, to pull in people to the Riverwalk. So, uh, next slide. We have. Uh, over 700 uh, investors in our developments. Uh, so we have a pool of investors that invest with me. Uh, so we have the financial capacity. Uh, we're one of the largest multifamily developers in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we own the largest solar array on any multifamily building east of the Mississippi River in the United States. Uh, in fact, we prob I'm told we have the most solar panels of any apartment de developer in the country <clears throat> on our buildings. Uh, we do a lot of green features. Um, these are bank references uh, and references of mayors of other cities that you're welcome to call and get references on uh, for us. Next slide. Um, so I'd be happy to take questions and uh, sorry I ran over there a little bit.
and Ms. Nyforth, um, I'm going to leave this uh, segment to you to, um, uh, I guess, facilitate the, the Q and A piece. Uh, looks like uh, we might want to consider giving the other presenters a, a little more time, but um, where, where are we at here? Um, yeah, if um, our DA members or council members have any questions um, for the T wall enterprise um, team, uh, right now you can um, ask the, you know them or else if there's anything else, you know, that you'd like city staff to follow up on, we can go that route too. Hi, this is Steve, Steve Hintz. Uh, my question is simply that you are proposing a large number of units. And you are putting them in 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 phases. Um, do you have any? Uh, I don't want to say doubts, but uh, perceptions about uh, filling up uh, nearly 300 units. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, given our experience, I and mean, I've been developing multifamily since uh, 1992, um, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that absolutely, without a doubt, there's no question that. Uh, we'll fill up about, you know, 75 to 100 units per leasing season kind of runs from February to August 31st. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you, you won't get more than that uh, per leasing season. It's just the dynamics of this Wisconsin market uh, and winters and everything. Um, we can fill up 300, no problem. I, I personally think and we're seeing, we're actually doing plans like in downtown Middleton, you know, we started with, we have 220 units here. Now we're doing a development that's going to have 700 units built over about 14 years. Um, we've got one on the east side. We've got 600 units planned uh, over 12 years. Uh, we've got literally, um, we're finding that doing phases and having a 10-year plan uh, in a lot of these locations, they can handle like 1,000 units. It's all about getting the heads and beds, the density. You need that disposable income to support uh, the retail, the restaurants, um, make people feel safe right in an area that used to be industrial uh, or difference being converted, you know. Um, no question we'll fill that, but we also want to be cautious about how much we put in per phase. Um, and we'd probably do one phase every year or every two years, depending on, you know, if there's a recession in there or not. Um, and, you know, we can accelerate or decelerate based on uh, leasing velocity. Um, but we can definitely get this lease. I, I think we could easily do a thousand units out here. Uh, eventually, I mean, you could, you could really have a transformative uh, development here, a catalyst that would really help uh, transform that whole corridor. And we toured that whole corridor, and there's there's so much opportunity. Um, it's really exciting. I mean, you could really, I mean, Nina, we're uh, we started with one building, 72 units. We just did a presentation this morning with them, where we have literally uh, five more four whole four whole blocks that would result in. Uh, 15 years worth of development to bring, you know, to really transform the downtown of Nina and really bring the density up to help support the small shops who have been so devastated by COVID. And before that, it was NAFTA. And before that, it was Walmart. You know, I mean, these poor shops in these downtowns have just been gotten killed, right? And so they need people downtown to, you know, spend money, right? Great. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. The one thing I also wanted to say that, you know, kind of related to that is, um, you know, I know we get asked to do condos. That question came up earlier uh, in this session. Um, the rules on condominiums change. I don't know if people realize that. It's almost impossible to do condominiums today. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac rules change. Uh, makes it impossible for buyers of condominiums to get a standardized loan. Banks don't want to make a loan that they have to hold in-house. So they don't like doing loans on condominium buyers. So unless the buyer has 100% cash, you're not going to get a standardized loan for a condominium unit. Uh, therefore, if there's no exit strategy for the developer, the developers can't get the development loans either for condominium development. So the only alternative is if you had a developer who put 100% cash in for construction and he was lucky enough to get 100% of his buyers to have 100% cash, then it could be done. But other than that, until those condominium rules change, uh, there's pretty much not going to be condominium development in, in this country. And you don't really see it except in those rare cases I just mentioned. And that's because of the rules of Fannie and Freddie back in the 2008 um, crash that we had. Thank you. Um, council, looks like Councillor uh, Wigahowski, do you have a question? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you including uh, 
whole page just for the target market because that was something I was looking for in all the proposals. Um, specifically with your uh, household income section, you had about roughly 50% would be over 60,000 and 25 would be over 80,000. What do you imagine that last 25% being, um, you know, whether it's more lower income or just like, I don't know, I guess, what, what do you imagine or envision uh, the rest of that being? So I want to clarify that the 50% uh, is over 60,000 and a half of that or 25% of total is over 80,000. So that accounts for 50%. Then the other 50% is under 60,000, but they still have pretty, you know, they have middle incomes. Um, if you're, if you want to get the lower incomes, for example, I highly recommend you go to a specialist, which would be a section 42 developer, tax credit developer. There are specialists who know how to do that. It's highly competitive of only one in, out of five get tax credits granted by W, uh, well, WIDA. Um, and then you put those low income, those workforce housing properties sort of on the periphery of the area, you know, not on your high value waterfront because that's where you want to maximize your rents. Because right now your rents are here in the market and we've got to show that the rents can be up here. Uh, in order to get the loan, right? So partly you close that gap with the land and the TIF, and part of that gap can be closed with higher rents. Now, once we work hard with you to get that up here, like we did at Green Bay and other cities in Middleton, then uh, you can. it's easier to get those next loans for phase two and phase three, and other developers can use our rents, you know, to get uh, higher loans. Um, and sometimes there's a local bias by ba local banks. They're like, oh, you'll never get those rents. Well, we did. You know, we got uh, rents that were 25% more in Green Bay than the market uh, because the market was, you know, garden style, two story with detached garages, you know. Um, so this is a different uh, product, um, but we will get it. We will, we will get the rents because people will love this. They'll want to be here. Uh, about 50% of our uh, residents will be young professionals, 30 or younger, and 50% will typically be 30 to 72. Um, we'll get about 50, 50 male, female. We talked about the income levels, um, and it's quite a diverse group. You know, it's, it's, we'll have studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and maybe some three bedrooms. Um, and you'll get a real diversity of people here, uh, that want to be here. Um, now admittedly, this is not low income. The, the cost of construction is very high, especially on soils like this. And, you know, there's probably contamination, et cetera. Um, you know, yeah. we've got to get those higher rents to help pay for the higher cost of construction. And then you as a city, you you fill this out with some Section 42 workforce housing, you know, somewhere else right within the periphery here uh, of this neighborhood, you know, uh, where they can walk to work or whatever. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the focus on, you know, younger people because I think and diversity in general, I think that's extremely important in the housing market today, especially for our community. A um, lot of other great things, but I'll save those for our discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad you asked that question, uh, Councilmember Wojciechowski. That was my question too. So if I could just uh, clarify, um, then the Green Bay and the Middleton uh, developments do not have any units that are below market rate in your development. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, you, in order to win the tax credits and do a section 42 project, you have to be a specialist and you have to have your building dedicated for yes. that purpose. And you, there's yes. a whole formula with a point score system and you got to yeah. get the points and, you know, you can't do that on our development. You really have to be doing it, you know, and, and of course, you know, the product is, it's a, you know, it's lower ceiling heights. There's, you know, it's pretty boxy. There's not a lot of Thank detail. You. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. All right. I don't, I don't want to, uh, uh, delay too much further, but um, are there other questions from uh, either council or RDA members for this group? I just, uh, this is Jason Lansky, I've got a question. Just one quick question that is, what are the, what's the range in rents that you're actually talking about? Um, if I remember, I had sent over, uh, Kelly had asked for a uh, market study from us. Um, we typically, we're kind of basing the rents off other rents around the Oshkosh area or other apartments around the Oshkosh area and what we've done in Nina and Green Bay as well. Um, so we're seeing around, you know, 800 to $1,000 for studios. Um, one bedrooms could be anywhere from like 1000 to $1,300. And then two bedrooms, um, I think if I remember correctly, 1300 to 1700 um, 
that's kind of what I mentioned before is we're basing our rents off what's in the area that's um, comparable to our product. Um, that's why we kind of used uh, the Nina, our Solaris building in Nina and City Deck in Green Bay as our um, milestones, I guess, for rent, rate, rent ranges. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah. Mr. Lasky, um, in the uh, packet that we sent, the RDA packet last week that Anna sent, we do have like a matrix in there and it has all the rental rates, the ranges that all developers um, submitted in their proposal in the column there. So you'd be able to see all that there too. Thank you. I did not see that in my packet. Thank nope, you. that's okay. Kelly, was that sent to council? I don't believe we got that. Um, Anna, I think it was sent to everybody, correct? Oh, she must, maybe she jumped off. I believe it was sent to everybody, but I can quick resend it again um, while we're listening to the next uh, presentation. And no rush. I just want, just curious to look at sure. it. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. You. Bunce and staff. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, moving forward uh, with the next presentation, uh, we have Alexander and Bishop Real Estate Capital Markets LLC. Um, they are a, a local organization here in Oshkosh. Uh, so we have Mr. Peter Youngbacher, um, who you see on the screen here. And um, Peter, um, do you have any of your team members with you? I see you have um, Brittany Youngbacher, and I think I saw um, John, both of your, uh, John Pavatny and like, like John Bohm. So if you wanna maybe introduce, just to make sure we didn't forget anybody who's on your team here. Oh, um, Mr. Youngback, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Kelly, thank you. Uh, Mayor Palmieri, members of the RDA, council members and, and city professional staff, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today and talk about our project. Uh, as Kelly was uh, saying, we have a couple of other members of our team, uh, uh, Brittany Youngbacher, uh, John Bain, John Pavoni, uh, also listening in. Uh, our project, uh, uh, which we have called Riverwalk, uh, is uh, a, a sort of different approach from what uh, uh, Terrence Wall's uh, project uh, is and, and probably will be perceived as different from some of the others. Uh, it's in large part uh, born out of perhaps uh, uh, our level of experience in the marketplace. We have eight multifamily communities here currently and, and a significant amount of retail space. And I think uh, our concept of development uh, is born out of the market uh, uh, information that we're receiving every day uh, from those projects and, and what we think is uh, a feasible, sustainable project uh, for, for this uh, uh, community uh, that we're proposing to develop. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our, our firm is based in Oshkosh. Uh, we have developed uh, 6 million square feet of space, uh, which includes uh, multifamily projects. Uh, we, we have done up to 3,500 units in the past. Uh, developed about 4 million square or 3 million square feet of, of uh, uh, industrial warehouse space uh, and about a million square feet plus of shopping centers and office space. Uh, we are, uh, again, based here in, in the community. Uh, we have uh, a long, deep history of projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, among them being uh, River Place, which uh, on the right side of the screen was developed uh, on property owned by the Payne Art Center. Uh, it had been an industrial site uh, for the Payne Lumber Company. It was destroyed by a tornado. Uh, we purchased the site and developed that parcel of land with 117 units underground parking, uh, limited surface parking. Uh, you'll see some additional pictures of that later. Uh, University loss, uh, a, a rehabilitation of a 60s vintage building a day away from being taken over by the city uh, through receivership. Uh, 
by the prior owner, we've invested substantial resources into securing a environmentally uh, substantially environmentally reduced footprint for this building. And again, we'll chat about uh, that and sustainability a little bit later in our presentation. Uh, next slide, please. A couple of other projects. Uh, Concord Place, uh, lower right corner, uh, just by way of context and background, the first uh, large scale density project in the Payne or the uh, 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 Marion uh, District project uh, built in 2003, uh, and then the sister property across the street, uh, Morgan Crossing, uh, built uh, in 2008 or 9, I believe. We have a second phase of that that uh, has been recently approved by the city for 83 units, a five story building that'll be off to the back left corner uh, using a similar architectural style. Uh, so that's a little bit of what we've done locally. Uh, next slide, please. Our vision of this site is a, a, a bit different than uh, the previous presentation and certainly some of the others, although there are some common themes. One of the concerns we have uh, obviously is the site itself. Uh, we're acutely aware of the development challenges related to soils condition and environmental contamination, uh, probably more so than, than the out of town developers having known the history of development along the river. Uh, we have developed uh, and we've proposed in our development a, a low stress uh, band of development along the immediate riverfront. We know uh, that that soil condition is tenuous at best and that if we develop uh, higher density, more weight bearing uh, projects that is going to substantially increase the costs and, and, and re remove the ability to build what is being proposed. Uh, along Main Street, uh, we have a 32 unit building uh, that uh, has 15,000 square feet of gross leasable area of retail space. Again, we have developed and own currently about a million square feet of that kind of space. We're acutely aware of the economics and uh, in a, the later shot, you'll see a, a elevation view of what that can look like. The other buildings uh, are 32 units each. Uh, they have underground parking. Uh, we haven't refined a lot of the interior space yet. Uh, you will see and have seen a lot of drawings with that. We'll show you some images of transactions and deals we've done locally to show you that it's, it's a point of focus for us uh, it's a detail that I think has to be hashed out and certainly reviewed by you and and others in the city before approval. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, a little more detail again of, of the units. Uh, 20 townhomes. The townhomes are, are designed to go to the very high end of the market. They're, they're large square footage units, two and three bedroom units, uh, two car uh, enclosed parking. Uh, vaulted ceilings, uh, an amenity mix that you would see in ownership housing, uh, fireplaces, washers and dryers, uh, granite countertops, uh, the full package of amenities that uh, will will take this to the various very highest end of the the rental market. Uh, the additional units uh, will will feature similar amenities. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we do have. Uh, an orientation of the building is to address a sound mitigation issue, which uh, for those of us who live in this neighborhood know it's a very real problem. And it's not something that can be glossed over. Uh, the decibel rating from a train uh, runs around at, at, at 15 meters, 45 meet, feet, it runs at 80 decibels. Uh, if you have spent time there, and if you haven't, I suggest that you do to understand the issue that this creates. Park your car at the end of Pioneer Drive while a train goes through, roll up your windows and try and understand how you deal with that noise issue. It's a, it's a very important issue, regardless of whom you pick for that developer to understand. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a image of a uh, street side view along South Main Street, uh, west facing east. Uh, we have again 15,000 or so net leasable GLA of, of uh, retail space, office space on the first floor. 
with a two story uh, residential podium above it, elevator serviced underground parking, uh, trying to enhance the streetscape uh, to integrate uh, uh, functions in the neighborhood into ground level activity uh, for the retail. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a courtyard view. Uh, we we didn't put a lot of landscaping in here because I want you to see the buildings as opposed to any hypothetical landscaping that will be going in. We'll show you some landscaping shots later. This architecture, uh, in, in terms of the density proposals you're seeing, uh, puts you at the mid to lower end of the density range. I think given our understanding of the market and the ability and capacity of the market to pay rent and the numbers that will be incurred by any developer uh, to build this space, it will result in a viable, economically viable, feasible, and leasable product for, for ownership. Uh, next slide, please. Which is another courtyard view. Uh, again, uh, we, we purposely kept the foundation plantings away uh, from the building so you could see what the buildings look like. Uh, a fairly traditional architectural style, something that we think is sustainable and will hold the test of time, will not date itself uh, architecturally uh, in the marketplace. And then the next slide is just a, a view out the window of uh, one of the units. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, the next slide is, uh, uh, you can back up one, please. Uh, this is the, the townhouse uh, view along the river. We've again pushed back the townhouses uh, from the river, creating an additional band of green space uh, to create more public space uh, along the, uh, the riverfront walkway. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a view uh, out one of the windows uh, looking at the bridge. Uh, again, the, the emphasis here is the fact that, that 25 times a day, you have train traffic that creates a considerable micro neighborhood issue that has to be dealt with by any developer at this site. And again, given the fact that we're in the neighborhood, we're acutely aware of it uh, on a literally an hourly basis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, our images didn't show a lot of landscaping imagery. We do uh, have, I think, best in class landscaping with our communities in the marketplace. The image on the left uh, is the courtyard at River Place Apartments, the project that was purchased from the Payne that we developed. And the image on the right is also uh, a courtyard view. You can see the uh, Congress Avenue bridge in the background. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an aerial view of uh, uh, Morgan Crossing, again, uh, dense landscaping along the uh, uh, perimeter of the exterior of the building, uh, all of which uh, I think softens the image of a fairly high density multifamily building in the marketplace. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, more imagery uh, replace a project built 35 years ago architecturally, I think. Uh, it's hard to place this data on and we'll have, I think, long term sustain, uh, sustainable architectural imagery. And then Concord Place, uh, lots of flowers. We continue to uh, do, I think, best in class landscaping. And then one more uh, slide on landscaping, please. Next slide, please. Uh, again, River Place Apartments uh, interior courtyard uh, took advantage of a thousand feet of river frontage. Uh, and I think have created an ability of tenants and the public to use that space. Uh, the upper right corner has a little notation, Institution Food Marketing Coalition. Uh, we purchase all of our landscaping product from uh, a venue that's sponsored by this entity. It, and it's part of our ongoing sustainability within our firm. Uh, this uh, location is in Dalton, Wisconsin, which is about 50 miles southwest of here. There are four locations in Wisconsin sponsored by the state, and they create a, a, a network of vendors uh, who can sell to uh, people like ourselves uh, and reduce the uh, supply chain uh, length uh, and costs and get uh, the product into the hands of users as quickly as possible. Uh, next slide, please. 
We also uh, are trying to future proof our projects as much as we can. And one of the uh, things that uh, we have done is engage uh, a product called uh, Brilliant Smart Home Automation. This product uh, is what we think is best of class in terms of automating uh, the apartment experience. It provides controls, as this slide says, over lights, doorbells, music, and climate. And the one that brought our our particular focus on this was climate. Uh, our residents uh, have complete automation control over heat, electricity use. They can monitor consumption. Uh, they can do all of this in place or remotely. It's all connected through the Internet of Things, and it gives them an ability to create uh, home-like environments in a rental context. Uh, it's something that is uh, highly uh, appreciated, and again, it tries to future-proof the ability of our residents to uh, uh, control their living environment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of our project overviews, uh, we, we have uh, a number of amenities that, uh, again, uh, are required for the higher end of the market. We have higher ceilings. Uh, we're proposing to use triple pane windows, which we've used at other projects. They're particularly important, again, because of sound mitigation at this project. Uh, we have uh, in-suite washers and dryers, granite countertops, uh, designer cabinetry, stainless steel appliances, uh, uh, Carrar tile tub surrounds, uh, uh, underground parking, which we'll take a, a moment to look at in a little more detail in a minute, and, and expansive balconies overlooking the uh, uh, overlooking the uh, the riverfront. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a representative example of a bathroom. Uh, again, full tile surrounds, granite countertops. Uh, uh, amenities that would appear in single family homes, uh, ownership environments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, kitchens, uh, these are kitchens at uh, River Place, uh, second generation kitchens, but they also reflect what we're doing in new projects. Uh, stainless steel appliances, designer faucets, uh, uh, granite countertops, uh, again, very high end features. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an, probably one of our most important slides. Uh, we, in our office, focus everything we do on trying to reduce and mitigate the carbon footprint for our projects. Uh, to that end, uh, we have been um, awarded as a finalist by Focus on Energy for 2021. Uh, for the initiatives that we had undertaken in our portfolio, both in the multifamily and commercial parts of our portfolio to reduce our carbon footprint. We also were the first developer in Wisconsin to utilize PACE financing. And PACE is an acronym that stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. It's a creature of federal Department of Energy and eventually state statute that allows developers to use financing, PACE financing as part of their capital stack for the specific purpose and goal of reducing carbon footprints for their developments. Uh, so we were proud to be the first developer to use it for a substantial multifamily rehabilitation. And we were even more proud to have it done for a project in this community in, in Oshkosh, which was the University Loss Project. Uh, we're also, uh, Developing the uh, uh, project uh, again with an eye towards getting as close to net zero as possible. Uh, uh, Wall Enterprises noted their use of uh, rooftop solar panels. Uh, we too are, are utilizing that with this project uh, in an effort to get again as close to net zero as possible. Uh, we will also have charging stations for what is the Obviously, prevailing trend in electric vehicles. Uh, we'll have uh, stations for uh, uh, bicycle racking uh, within our project and for uh, the uh, uh, bird esque type. I think there was a presentation to the council members uh, regarding uh, a, a bird, uh, which is the uh, the, the moped uh, uh, bike. Uh, uh, 
concept that uh, should kind of be able to come to our community as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is just a press release from PACE uh, indicating uh, the participation that we had with the uh, University of Los. That's an earlier shot during during remodeling. We're, we're just finishing the last in building. Uh, we'll be commencing the interior exterior landscaping work in, in, in earnest next week. Uh, but we've taken all of those units and completed all of them for a, uh, uh, a completely updated uh, building that will now have 50 years of additional life with it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, commercial amenities, we talked about uh, the, the first floor facing uh, the, the Main Street project. Uh, we do have a substantial amount of commercial experience. Uh, the, the left side is a, a suburban style picture, uh, but just to show you that we, we, we know what the market in the community is and what rental rates are, and that's impacted our design ability uh, or design uh, of the project and our ability to financially model what we think is a, a viable uh, uh, product. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, this addresses the sound mitigation from the train. This is a view from the bridge back towards the project. Uh, we're taking every effort, uh, making every effort to re reduce what is going to be a, a issue that will again have to be understood and designed for uh, through triple pane windows, additional uh, sound insulation uh, on the exterior walls, uh, the, 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 the siting of the buildings to mitigate uh, uh, broad branch buildings against the sound. Uh, and uh, then uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're down to two more slides. Uh, our financing package is a, a, a bit different and, and probably because we've looked at our unit mix, uh, uh, we have a, a, a unit mix, well, totally 160 units. It's the scale of which is obviously different than the first presentation and a few of the other presentations. I think that scale is appropriate uh, for the market and for the site. And that, again, that's born out of our current participation through our eight residential multifamily communities in the marketplace. Uh, we know that all developers today are being challenged by significantly increasing costs. Uh, uh, it was alluded to in the first presentation. We can underscore it here in the second. You'll hear it from the others. Uh, lumber, for example, has increased in cost significantly since last year uh, to the tune of, of 350 to 400%. Those are going to be challenges for all of us uh, in this this uh, this development. But our, our project at the moment is scaled as follows. About $35 million of project cost. Uh, we will have 15% uh, equity, so we're going to be in the area of uh, $6 million of equity. Uh, that equity is equity from this, this office, uh, it's local equity, uh, ownership will remain here in the community. Uh, and as we did with River Place, which was developed 35 years ago, uh, we build for multi-generational holding. Uh, so we take a very long view of what is traditionally a long game enterprise. Uh, and we anticipate that this project would be uh, held uh, in local ownership for the foreseeable future. Uh, we have about 12% of our project for PACE financing. That element is used again to get us down to net zero or as close to net zero as possible. Uh, we have used PACE financing in several projects and have uh, uh, this, this financing uh, a source identified through a PACE lender uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, we're asking for uh, uh, about 23% of our project to be TIF financing. We have a screen on that that'll come up in just a minute and the balance will be uh, a construction loan. Our TIF uh, would be a PAYGO TIF. Uh, we would monetize the TIF through a third party source, but we have recognized that it would be a, a PAYGO TIF. Uh, our project timeline, uh, next slide please. Uh, our project timeline is is uh, construction completed upon, or commencement of construction starting upon the completion of the environmental remediation. Uh, there's still a lot of question marks regarding that and uh, how th that will be accomplished. Uh, I think all of the developers have a similar view uh, about uh, the, the, the responsibility of the city to provide a clean site. 
we would then uh, commence the townhouse construction uh, on uh, sometime, hopefully in 22, uh, for availability in the spring of 23. And then in the spring of 23, we've also commenced the construction of the uh, 36 unit, uh, 32 unit building on, on Main Street and the 36 unit buildings in the uh, interior of the project uh, with the completion of uh, 24. Uh, so uh, again, we have fewer units. Uh, we have a tighter time frame for uh, start and completion of our project. Uh, again, we're asking for a 15 year TIF. 90% uh, of the reimbursement uh, of the increment, the 10% would be available for other uh, market area activity. Uh, the next slide has a chart that would show approximate uh, assessed values uh, and dates of those assessed values. And again, remember January 1 is the assessment date for the state. Uh, and uh, those, those dates would reflect the values as of those dates. Uh, and the final chart is uh, something you can peruse at your leisure. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, and it's a review of, of all the things that we took into account as we were trying to design uh, the site. Uh, we looked at a number of different variables. Uh, again, this is something for your later review. Uh, again, our our goal here is to um, build a project that we think is uh, achievable financially, uh, given the current market's ability and capacity of uh, residents to pay, uh, to do it over a period of time that's relatively short so that real estate cycles hopefully won't intervene. We, we know that there are those uh, black swan events out there that can cause substantial delays for projects that uh, uh, have long time frames and stage development. Uh, we're again a local developer. Uh, we anticipate uh, owning this project in our portfolio for a considerable period of time. Uh, I think we've proven through a number of developments in the community that we are an attentive uh, property manager and address the long term physical needs of our properties on an ongoing basis. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, Mayor Paul Mary, council members, uh, RDA members, and, and professional staff. Do RDA members have questions for Mr. Youngbacher? Or council members, excuse me. Didn't mean to exclude you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our next presentation. Uh, this presentation uh, will be by Chet Wiesenberg, Tim Hess, and Kip Golden. And uh, they actually have a video that they um, uh, put together for us. So um, Chet, Tim, or Kip, do you guys have anything you'd like to say before we show your video? Roll it, roll the tape. <laughs> oh, you're muted. <laughs> Okay, go. Um, we'd really like to just start off by thanking everybody for your time and uh, let you know that we're really proud of what we've done and excited uh, to uh, kind of share our presentation with you and answer any questions you have. Um, we have uh, put a lot of thoughts and um, um, intent into this, and we're very confident in what we're proposing. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, Stephen, could we roll the video, please? Good evening, my name is Tim Hess. 
Tonight, I'm going to walk you through the River North proposal by the Wittenberg Architects team. But before we begin, we want to acknowledge the significant efforts and resources that have brought the Sawdust District to this present stage. We applaud the work of the RDA, sure, sure. Urban Council, and city staff. We appreciate that what goes here will impact the city's built environment and landscape for the next 100 years. And thus, we are humbled to be considered to give a proposal for our community's future. Our team is being led by local architect Chet Wiesenberg. He is first and foremost an architect, but also happens to be Oshkosh's largest home builder and a commercial general contractor, providing a unique perspective to lead the overall development. I am Chet's business partner and serve as the Wiesenberg team's business manager. I'm also a real estate analyst with Invista Analytics and specialize in inquiring development incentives for a wide array of projects. In recent years, we've partnered with Andy Dumkey, consider the Granary or Smith School. Andy is also a partner in Alliance Development, one of the largest commercial real estate developers in Northeast Wisconsin. He's also a partner in North Point Development, which specializes in affordable housing across the entire state. What we're proposing here is no small task. And thus, we felt it appropriate to expand our team and bring in experience with recent local mixed use projects. Kip Golden is the executive vice president and co owner of CR Structures, a general contractor from Appleton. He's also a managing member of YBR Properties. Brett and Molly Hildebrandt are also managing members of YBR and offer insight in his strategic planning and marketing. The YBR team recently completed the mixed use block 800 project in College Avenue in downtown Appleton. Four weeks ago, they also celebrated the groundbreaking on the Bryn redevelopment in downtown Menasha. Both of these projects are consistent with what we are proposing here and thus make these team members a most welcome addition to the overall development team. So when we first considered this project, we took inventory of all the references provided. The Sawdust District Master Plan was finalized a little over a year ago. It is timely and quite honestly, very prescriptive. The RFP itself explicitly calls for multifamily housing. So when we look at the master plan, we see that it explicitly calls for providing a variety of price points and possibly providing both rental and condominium configurations, such that we serve young professionals, seniors, and workforce residents. And thus began our design checklist. Given this property is adjoining to the Fox River, it is clearly a waterfront development. Here, the master plan suggests that we avoid walling off the waterfront. Rather, we should seek to provide views as far inland as possible. Thus, we added this too to our design checklist. Next, this area encompasses portions of South Main Street. This is what the master plan refers to as the core. Traditional downtown, a main street, has a traditional style. Specifically, the master plan calls for mixed use within a two to four story building and that the architecture would feature a modern industrial style. Again, we added this to our checklist. Next, the Sawdust District, as a name alludes to Oshkosh's past and references our prominence within the lumber industry, the master plan appropriately calls for embracing our historic past and suggests that the design be influenced by employing complementary materials, reusing elements to connect with the district past, and ultimately providing a unique character to Oshkosh that distinguishes us from other communities. Again, we add this to our checklist. Okay, so we've shown you our goals for the design. Now let's discuss our proposal and how it meets these objectives. Here is the site plan. We first consider the building spacing. Place the condominium buildings such that the inland structures would still achieve river views and vice versa. But it wasn't just spacing. The massing and building heights also facilitate this. Note the buildings along 9th Avenue being two-story, 
allows the South Main Street buildings to look over the top for lake views and sunrises. Now let's take you all on a virtual tour of our River North proposed development. We'll visit each building and discuss how each individual design decision help meet the overall objectives of the master plan. Let's start with the condominiums along the riverfront. The form and shape of these buildings are inspired by the Payne Lumber Company and Buckstaff buildings. The exteriors are covered in brick and metal. There are 17 units in each building. Note the accessory building in the middle with a pool. There's underground parking servicing each building. The owners will have access to boat slips what we're really offering here is a unique ownership opportunity in downtown Oshkosh and have heard consistent positive feedback on this new product. Next, we'll move to the workforce apartments, but first we'll pass by the small pavilion that will serve the entire development. These buildings have a simple utilitarian form. They'll house 40 total apartment units. The buildings are inspired by factories and warehouses in Oshkosh's industrial districts. With two stories and surface parking, we're trying to achieve cost effectiveness here. Buildings are clad in brick with large windows and divided lights. We are trying to achieve what Governor Evers suggested in his latest budget proposal, that TIF be used to provide affordable workforce housing. Only in this case, in the dynamic environment of downtown Oshkosh near the water. The mixed use Main Street buildings will house 55 high end apartment units with underground parking. The rooftop patio will have views to the lake. The modern industrial scale and window rhythms are consistent with a historic downtown. Matching brick color complements neighboring buildings and an enclosed walkway references connections at the Buckstaff and Old Morgan Door buildings. Large welcoming storefronts adorn 18,000 square feet of commercial space on the first floor. We went for a distinguished and historically sensitive architectural context. Again, the Sawdust District Plan, created by our community, lays out a roadmap for the goals and objectives that we're trying to achieve. Our proposal provides a variety of housing options with workforce affordable and high-end rentals and provides a unique ownership opportunity in the condominiums. Our proposal is intentionally designed to ensure waterfront views are achieved as far inland as possible. We have embraced Oshkosh's historic past with our modern industrial design reinterpreting architectural elements of our historic buildings that have been lost over time and yet maintaining a traditional downtown feel. Again, we are excited for the future of the Sawdust District and the future of Oshkosh and hope that you will agree that what we have shown you today is a glimpse into what is next for all of us in this community. Again, we thank you for your time and consideration, but now invite any questions or feedback. Uh, this is Steve Hintz. Um, I have two questions. One question is a, about your legal structure. It looks like uh, you're dividing up the project with three separate uh, LLCs. Um, my question and my concern is simply about who ultimately is going to be responsible for the whole project. Who will be responsible for the whole project? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so Chet's going to be the, the lead architect on this, and we have worked with the, the YBR properties. You see there's, there's overlap in two of the LLCs. So the, the Wiesenberg Architects, Wiesenberg Homes team is going to handle the condominiums, and then we're also going to be the ones to address the workforce housing and then we've got the YBR team that will ultimately be responsible for uh, the South Main Street portion of it. Uh, and I appreciate that this is a challenge, but I, I think so too, we feel very comfortable that we have worked with uh, this other team before and that collaboratively we can work through all the issues to make it happen. 
Yeah, I can see well, the main reason we did this was to divide it up so that we could uh, feel comfortable with each each phase being completed in a timely manner. So it wasn't all put on top of one developer. Um, we have the energy and uh, equity and uh, um, experience of three different teams. Yeah, this is Kip Gold. Um, sorry, this is Kip Golden. Um, another thing is we each have kind of our specialties and the stuff that we're um, that we're all kind of known for. Um, and those are the pieces that each of us are are taking. We all have, have we've all worked together in the last uh, you know a bunch of years uh, on different projects. Um, and uh, obviously our group is is also the group that's working over on the Miles Kimball project that'll be starting up here shortly. Uh, and we worked with uh, with Chet and Tim on that one uh, throughout the entire process. So uh, and as well as uh, um, you know Dumpkeys on, on uh, some of their projects in the, in the past. So. This group is uh, well aware of each other and uh, has those working relationships already worked out. Um, so we, uh, this should be pretty streamless. Good, thank you. I have uh, one other question and this is about uh, finance. Uh, in one place in the finance section, you're referring uh, to sources of money, uh, personal investment and sweat equity. I don't find those to be terribly precise uh, concepts. Can you help me? I, I didn't hear that. You said, what do we mean by sweat equity? Well, there's. Chet is an architect. He would typically charge architectural services, but in the condominium and the workforce apartments, you know, he's going to be contributing that. Uh, so to general contracting, uh, we would anticipate not necessarily charging ourselves the money for it, although from an accounting standpoint, we certainly are, but we would contribute that. I know that the, the YBR team has had a history too of asking some of the subcontractors to also contribute some of the sub, some of their equity, some of their work and, and take ownership uh, interest in the project to be able to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Do you have any concrete numbers though? Uh... I mean, uh, I'm trying to look at you know, the overall financing of the project, and, and I, I'm not finding that in there. Sorry, Steve, we're having a hard time hearing you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, I, I, I'm, I've been disconnected a couple of times. Uh, I'm, I'm still kind of looking for. Uh, uh, breakout of the different sources of financing for the project. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we were intending on coming in with 15% equity, that that would be a combination of uh, the sweat equity and actually cash from those of us that choose to own this. Uh, and then typically we're going to be using a 80% loan to value on a traditional loan. Uh, so that's going to cover, you know, roughly 50% of the overall project. Uh, we are also interested in utilizing PACE like Peter, uh, but in our case with condominiums, we cannot use PACE in that one. In that particular case, uh, you know, despite what one of the previous uh, presenters suggested, you know, we have done condominiums already and we've already talked with the bank about this and they have suggested to us, look, if you can bring in uh, 30%, sell 30% of the units, we're going to, we're going to give you the financing. We can make that happen. Uh, and then TIFF would, would likely be contributing roughly to 20% of the overall cost, but in large respect, that contributes for, to a lot of the, the major additional uh, costs that are, are going to be buried on this site with the environmental contamination uh, and that kind of thing. So collectively, we think, well, in large part, we have very intentionally designed this to try to do a bunch of cost saving measures to try to limit uh, how much it's going to cost in terms of the remediation, keeping all the fill on site. Uh, not necessarily digging down and doing underground parking. I appreciate that you get, you know, a, a little more beautification out of that, 
but that ends up substantially increasing the cost. And, and what we trade off then is the ability to provide, say, the, the workforce affordable health. We can put this together uh, within what we're asking for is a, an eight month option period. And that by that point in time, we will have everything lined up. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? I, I just have one, and that is um, I'm looking at the matrix that um, uh, Kelly, uh, Ms. Knifeworth put together for us here. And when we talk about uh, affordable workforce housing, it looks like um, there is quite a range here suggested. It looks like starting out, you know, 750 to 950 for a one bedroom. Uh, just a quick question, uh, would would there be any intention of um, any of the the units being below market rate? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, th I think we've had this conversation uh, a number of times, Lori, that those rental rates there are rental rates that are consistent with uh, the affordable housing. When you look at the HUD standards in terms of what you can charge for a two bedroom, and you're talking about uh, being nine hundred dollars there, that is technically affordable. Uh, our intent, though, is to commit to you know again what Governor Evers is calling for the affordable workforce housing standard, and that is typically, I believe, between uh, sixty and one hundred and twenty percent of the area median income. Right. So let, let's go ahead, Laurie, if I can Thanks. jump in. But, uh, yes. I mean, I think that's really one of the strong suits of our proposal is the diversity of markets. Um, so, you know, as an architect, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright finished his career off with Usonian Homes in a mission to provide good design to, you know, uh, less, uh, you know, economically privileged people. and. I think that that's something that we've been trying to do as a team in, in Oshkosh is hit different markets. And we know we can do that by just changing up types of construction and keeping it at two stories. Um, and then we know what we can do on Main Street with the underground parking and the elevator buildings. And we're also really confident in bringing the condominium market to downtown Oshkosh. Uh, just this last year, um, we sold, we, we've sold 21 of our 23 homes over on the west side, and we expect to be finishing that project, you know, a couple of years ahead of, ahead of schedule. Um, there is a strong demand for condominiums, and that'll, that'll be the higher end market, of course. But, um, but we, we, we can hit these bug, these rent numbers, and we can serve, you know, uh, you know, let lower rents, we can serve a different part of the community by doing that. And it doesn't have to be a light tech project. And thank you for that. And I, I guess I was just thinking about, um, it's almost like a, a meta um, reflection of workforce housing in the design of not just the physicality and the brick and mortar piece, but the uh, diversity reflecting some of that history as well with uh, some of our former um, working class community members. So thank you. Were there any other questions from any council members or RDA members before we move on to the next presentation? It doesn't appear so. So thank you, Chad. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Kip, uh, for your video and. Uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Um, our next uh, proposal was from Red Earth LLC. Um, and that um, today, I believe we have Jake Bushwell and um, Kevin Burrow. And uh, they are looking to um, present their proposal for what they envision in the Southeast District. Um, Jake or Kevin, would you like to make, I wanna make sure I introduce everybody that is on the call representing your team here today. Yeah, so we have, uh, I'm Jake Buswell, Rick Byers, Matt Buswell, and Todd Page today. 
And then Kevin is also remotely joining us. He is our uh, architecture firm for Canopy and Bruce. Uh, welcome. We plan to have three people speak today. Hopefully, our presentation will cover to your satisfaction on who Red Earth LLC is, our multifaceted business model, and how we plan to meet the needs of, of the city of Oshkosh. Thank you for the opportunity today. My name is Jake Buswell, site and project coordinator for Red Earth LLC, and I'm also 20% owner of Red Earth and vice president of American Constructions, the general contractor that would be used for this project. Currently, I serve as chairman for the Wisconsin Retail Lumbermen's Association, as well as chairman for the Wisconsin Lumber Dealers Education Foundation. Uh, next, up, next slide, please. Uh, apparently, there is some confusion on the ownership of the sawdust apartments, and I'll clear things up now. Red Earth LLC will own and operate 100% of this project. There are five 20% owners, all with a long history together. There will be no outside investors, no outside management company. Matter of fact, our group, as outlined in our proposal, develops, constructs, owns, and manages all of our properties. Around 1,000 units and more continually coming online. Our five partners have over 100 combined years of construction experience and about the same in the apartment business. And we currently employ over 155 people throughout our various entities. Uh, next slide, please. Our group has a great deal of enthusiasm for this project. Actually, we have more partners wanting to speak than time will allow. I would like to touch a few brief subjects. Commercial property. I would like to point out while we did not have commercial property designed on our proposal, we are flexible enough to look at that potential. Later, Kevin will show you renderings of an option that would give you give us over 15,000 square foot of commercial space on South Main Street. As with any development, design details can and will most likely change from our preliminary drawings. Contamination. We have worked with multiple municipalities before, most recently the city of Baraboo, to overcome challenges of contaminated soils. The adverse conditions of this site we currently know about are not unsurmountable. However, we need, to, we need a pinpoint plan to be adopted that deals with additional unforeseen contamination issues. Uh, community amenities. I hope you notice the community park recreation area near the railroad tracks. We feel the concept is an elegant way to utilize a challenge area near, near the tracks. We believe the density unit sizes and green space that we provide in our proposal will meet the sawdust district master plans and goals okay now i'd like to introduce rick byers 20 percent owner and, and site and project coordinator he is also co-owner of three Migos property management and will speak to our business model and kevin burrows from community and bruce architects will follow on the thought behind the intricate design and show an example of what multi-use on South Main could look like if you partner with us. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Rick Ricardo. I am a, a member of Three Amigos and also a member of Red Earth. Uh, Jake asked me to speak about a couple of different things today. Um, one of the things is about the residential versus commercial. Um, residential is a very simple uh, formula. You build it, they will come. Um, and I think one of our previous uh, presenters at Hip and Nail on that, you're looking at about 75 to 100 units to be absorbed a year. Um, and again, on the residential side, you build it, they will come. On the commercial side, commercial side is a different animal. It's 180 degrees different from residential. Um, we've been involved in constructing and managing uh, not only multifamily, but we also have commercial properties on our books. Uh, I've been developing real estate for over 30 years. Um, and as far as a commercial animal goes, uh, for example, if you have a restaurant or let's say you place an office or you place a retail, those three individual uh, businesses have different needs, wants, and demands in a shell. And so the way you always do it, the way we've always done it, and most developers that I am that do it on a commercial space is you get the tenants lined up first and then you build the space. It's completely opposite of residential uh, real estate. 
And so our plan on the commercial space is a little elusive because we don't have an end plan right now. And nobody I'm guessing in this mix does have end units uh, and a user yet. So I don't want to gloss over the commercial space because it's an important component of this development and it really lends itself. Um, I can envision a small restaurant bar and uh, tenants and ourselves included being able to, to use that space and it will really complement everything that's in the Sawdust District. It will also complement our apartments. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk to you today about is three amigos. Who are three amigos? Well, Todd, me, and Brian are three amigos. It's a company we started uh, when we first bought our first rental property together. And um, it's one of those companies that started off kind of small and insignificant, and over the years it has grown. My first employee, Timmy, still works for me. Um, we have long term employees that I get to work with every day. Going into the office is a joy. Um, I'm sure Kelly is probably amazed at how many times Jake has called her with questions. I know Jake was up five hours the other night talking about different things. Um, we're just enthused about this project. Not only are we enthused about this project, but our office is enthused about this project. We have two people already committed their key essence. One, one's Oshkosh Shack. Can we move? Can we manage that? Can we ma ma uh, maintain that? We're just, it's just the word around the office constantly. Oshkosh, Oshkosh, Oshkosh. And the reason I want to talk about Three Amigos is because I think at the end of the day, this property is going to be built. Uh, there's going to be buildings there. And buildings are inanimate objects. It's really about the people. Uh, what does this property look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years after it's built? And that's all on the responsibility of the property management. And we have a property management company that the only thing we manage is the properties that we own. And the properties that we own are only managed by three amigos. Um, if you look at our Google reviews, we have 137 reviews on Google. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a 4.7 star rating on uh, Google. I would put that up against any other property management company in this country. But if you start reading some of the reviews, can you have the next slide, please? I would encourage you to look at Google reviews on not only us, but our competition, and look at other people that you know of that are property managers that you think are good. And I think you will find that we stand out. We stand above that problem. I'd like to read one review from Carrie uh, Casper. Um, I, I just think she hit the nail on the head and encapsulates everything that we do and what we're good at. Carrie writes, over two years ago, I discovered three Migos property management and I'm here to stay. I've rented my whole life in the cross area and hands down, three Migos is the best management company I've rented from. Their staff is always available, prompt with communication, genuinely care about their resident, residents, take pride in their properties and their maintenance crew is second to none. I appreciate how they send an email or a text keeping their residents in the loop if there's something we need to be aware of. Uh, such as a fire alarm, parking, etc. I really love how they, the need to contact them. I can email or even text. As a busy professional, I appreciate being able to easily reach out. Maintenance requests and your rental payments are done easily online. Love their app. We got an awesome app. We've been proud of our app. And we can watch our progress if we submit a maintenance request. You'll leave a note stating, they were there and what work was completed, uh, what was what work was completed. One time they even wrote out how adorable my kitty was. Uh, when I, uh, that leads into a significant reason why I chose three amigos. They accept and welcome pets. And the pet fee is reasonable. They're absolutely fair in renting costs overall and are excellent to their residents. When I first moved in, I appreciated the time and detail which the staff went over our rental information. It came nicely prepared in a folder with a resident guide. I'm not just saying this, but look no further. I'm, I am so glad I finally found my forever home in our college uh, where I live. I'm happy and confident to do business with Three Amigos Property Management now in the, in the future. This was one of our tenants. And if you start reading some of our Google reviews, they all 
that's now there's some bad ones in there too. We took over a property and uh, it was mismanaged. Um, there's a couple of clunkers in there. We don't have a five star, we have a 4.7. But for a commercial or you know, residential property management company, uh, I just, it's fantastic. And I'm so proud of the people that I work with on a day to day basis that we've been able to achieve these type of numbers. Um, that's all I have for uh, my notes. I would love to answer any questions that you may have, but I will uh, kick this on to uh, Kevin from Canopy and Ruth. And next slide, please, Kevin. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kevin Burrow. I'm the managing member of Canopy and Ruth Architects. We are an award winning firm located in Middleton, Wisconsin, and our specialty is multifamily housing. We have the privilege of working in many different communities throughout the area, providing much needed housing in these communities. You go to the next slide, please. My role is to present the overall project design and intent here. Um, the summary is shown here, but if we could jump to the next slide, I can describe things as I go over these statistics. So with the overall layout, we've really engaged the overall design here in trying to create a cohesive community that is being developed here that is interconnected and very livable, walkable, and part of the community as well. Utilizing the beautiful river walk along the northeast side, um, making intentional connections to the um, trailhead as well, and also creating a main pedestrian pathway throughout the development in many directions. We're trying to maximize views to the river, opening up vistas from the surrounding areas as well. So coming down West 8th Avenue, you have a clear shot straight through to the river and to the lake beyond and then just maximizing the layouts of the buildings to be as efficient as possible. So the main pedestrian connection through is maintained by varying the texture of the pavement. So even as you're driving through, you come across these zones that will inherently allow, force you to slow down and pay attention to pedest potential pedestrians within the area. So the way we have this laid out, we are proposing a total of seven buildings in this development to be built in phases and we'll have a total of approximately 338 apartment units. Each of these buildings are four story buildings and we have underground parking under each building. So we're able to achieve a parking ratio of 1.5 stalls per unit and virtually almost a one to one stall per unit under building and then with the additional surface parking. And as was mentioned previously, we have the uh, mixed use buildings proposed along South Main Street. I'll get to those in a little bit, um, but the, in the heart of this community, we've also created a um, central clubhouse area with a um, community room and the pool, and then we'll be utilizing the property to the southeast as a public park area where we're proposing some pickleball courts, basketball, and then additional surface parking to be utilized for the trailhead as well, so that all public would have access to that. And then as a transition between our developments and the river walk creating the shared plaza area, which would be very inviting for everyone. The overall mix of units will be providing studios, ones, twos, and even some three bedroom apartments throughout this. So we can have a variety of users and residents from young adults to business professionals up to retirees, including small families as well. So we wanna make sure we have an offering for everybody in this community. You could go to the next slide, please. For the overall design along uh, South Main Street, we are looking at proposing a potential mixed use building where the entire first floor is commercial space, as has been shown in several of the previous uh, presentations, but really integrating to the design of this building to the overall design of all the buildings within the complex, such that it's a very cohesive design. So we're able to provide first floor direct walk-in parking we are even encouraging in introducing parallel street parking along South Main by vacating some of the property and allowing it so that the street could be expanded for parallel parking. And then each of the buildings would have about 7,500 square feet of commercial space available to them while maintaining the residential space above, but setting it back such that the commercial does stand out and holds a strong presence along South Main Street. You go to the next slide. You can see some various views of this proposed commercial space as you're driving down Main Street. So ample area for signage, some outdoor plaza spaces. So you could have 
a restaurant with outdoor dining, well landscaped. Um, and then the units above would have the amenity area of being able to have larger patios on top of the space as well. And then the building does transition back. So it's a total of four stories, but from the sidewalk view, it's basically a two story feel with a high commercial presence along this area. Next slide. So here's another view looking back. And then here's where you also get a glimpse down through that pedestrian area that we're creating, which connects from Main Street all the way to the Riverwalk, such that people can come and go through here, utilizing this beautiful site that we have available to us. So with that, I'll turn it back over uh, for some closing comments. Thank you, Kevin. We view this as a long-term relationship, and we are flexible with the upfront design details to create the vibrant and welcoming community the master plan calls for. Thank you again for this opportunity, and please consider our team for this long-term partnership. Uh, now, we'd like to open up for any questions you may have. Thank you so much um, for your presentation. Uh, do the uh, council members or RDA members have any questions? Thank you for the presentation. Sure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And uh, we'll move on to our next presentation. Um, this is um, uh, uh, Tadich Investment Partners. Uh, we have Jason Tage here and Bob Grabowski. And uh, we're going to do something a little bit different for this presentation. Um, uh, I think Jason, maybe I'll let you kind of take it away and explain what how you're going to present uh, your proposal today. Oh, you just unmute yourself there. Let's see. Perfect. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, members of the RDA and council members. We appreciate uh, your time today and and the opportunity to present our project. Uh, we're going to take a little break from you know some of the the PowerPoint presentations here. We're going to take a, 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 the first couple minutes and talk to you a little bit about who we are and what we do and a little bit about who we're not and what we don't do. Uh, first of all, my name is Jason Toddick. Uh, the name of my company is Toddick Investment Partners, and I'm a real estate developer and investor, and I develop uh, maintenance-free communities, maintenance-free luxury living communities, whether they be for uh, ownership or whether they be for rental. Uh, and well, this is Bob Grabowski from Grabowski Builders, and I'll let Bob tell you a little bit about what he does. Good afternoon. Um, my brother Steve Grabowski and myself are partners. Our family's been building higher-end luxury homes in the Brown County and Northeast Wisconsin area since 1964. Um, we primarily focus on more of the custom and middle to upper-end homes in this area. We do a little bit of development. Um, the project we're gonna show you today is our latest development that is high-end residential condos. Um, the condominiums are sing built in kind of a duplex manner and they're approximately 4,000 square feet per unit with uh, four stalls of garage. Um, and they're on the riverfront in, in De Pere, Wisconsin, right in front of the Fox River Trail, um, which is a very, very busy corridor for exercising. Perfect, thanks Bob. So what we're going to do uh, at this point in time is uh, I'm going to, I guess, probably change our feed over to my phone and, and we're going to walk around the, the project that, that Bob and his team have developed here in De Pere. It's called Pelican Landing. It's a, uh, it's, it's a 12 unit luxury condominium de uh, development. It sits right on the shores of the Fox River in downtown De Pere and literally 60 feet off of the Fox River Trail. So very similar to what we're proposing uh, in, in, in downtown Oshkosh in the Sawdust District. So one of the things we're not going to do, we're not going to walk you through a rehash of our proposal today. Uh, I think we've put that on paper and everybody's had the opportunity to, to review that. Uh, we'd like this to be really, really interactive for people. So if you want us to stop as we're walking around or you want us to show you something as, as we're showing you the project, uh, please do so. So we're you know, this, this is meant for you to get an idea of who we are and, and what we do. So our project consists of a total of 30 units, 12 of them sited right on the, on the Riverwalk, 
and 18 of them sited in six unit buildings uh, just just uh, across the alleyway from, from the river walk with uh, looking through the view corridors of the other buildings. We're proposing a, a, a combination of sixplexes, duplexes, and triplexes. They can be built in separate phases and will be built in separate phases as and when the units are committed by private owners but, you know, for custom and semi-custom home building. So again, we are not apartment developers. We're, we do not try to be all things to all people. There's some terrific, terrific apartment developers that presented today with some tremendously impressive uh, proposals. Uh, we have a little bit of a different view for the site. Our proposal is all about home ownership uh, in, in the downtown Oshkosh area. And with that, I think we're going to switch over to our video feed and I'm going to let Bob, uh, I'm going to walk with the, with the camera and I'm going to let Bob describe what we're looking at. So thanks for your time. Let's, let's take a walk. Okay. So Um, Jason and Bob, I think you might need to unmute your phone. Oh, Jason. Can anybody else hear them? Am I the, okay. Jason? No, no, we can't hear any of it. Okay. Hold on. Um, Stephen, are you able to unmute their phone? Oh, I'm sorry about that. No, okay. No, we got you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. So go ahead. If you sorry. want to start over, sure. Thank you. All right. Can you turn the volume up on our end here? Keep going. It's not up. Can you hear can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yep. We can hear you. I apologize. We're starting on what I would call the rear end of the of the project because the, the front of the house faces the water. But we are in uh, just nine tenths of a mile from downtown to Pier. We secured this land in 2018 and started construction in the very end of 28, um, 2018 and finished the project in 2019. Um, there's 485 feet of frontage on the Fox River Trail, which is what we consider our waterfront. And um, we were able to build four waterfront um, basically duplexes. The condominiums are 4,000 square feet per unit. And then if you look behind Jason, we had space on the area to do some secondary garages. The garages are 26 by 30 feet. We're not proposing these at this time for this site, but this ended up being a pretty big selling point. Uh, I had customers asking me for high-end condominiums that were close to the center of action on the river. Um, what we saw here is an extremely high demand for something very walkable so people can hop on the trail or the sidewalks and get downtown or on their bikes um, in more of an urban setting, but they also wanted the waterfront um, experience, which is much of what we're going to see here. So um, we had high end finishes, a lot of stone work, um, expensive uh, shake siding, built cedar pergolas to kind of soften up the touch, solid wood doors. Once you come into the, the, the home, we're looking at 10 foot high first floor ceilings as opposed to eight or nine foot, which are more standard. Um, all of the homes were able to be customized. So no two look alike and the floor plans do change. We would not be encouraging as much customization for the price point we're looking at in Oshkosh uh, at this point. But really a lot of it's going to be determined by who signs up as customers. Here we, we secured the land because I had people tell me there was a desire for something like this. And we never went to market on it. People thought that we had it and we had commitments before we closed on the land. And um, so it, it changed the way we built the products. So we come in from the front door and opens up to a nice open living space. Um, it's an area that people can still gather with their friends and family. Uh, it's big enough to be able to have your family back if you are a couple of empty nesters, um, small enough to live every day. So, Nice spacious kitchen with higher end um, appliances. The refrigerator and freezer are cabinet doors on the end. Um, this is a thing that we have also in our design. That would be a nice area for coffee or could be turned into an office. Um, we call this the keeping room uh, overlooking the waterfront. And some of the things that we're finding must have in customers in the higher end market. Everybody wants a big 
walk-in pantry and we generally build custom cabinetry in the pantries it's a great place for people to stage um, appliances toasters coffee pots things like this and it gives them more of an open concept out in the main kitchen area um, for entertaining and just keep things clean there's first floor master bedrooms on all these plans uh, they're spacious with tile walk-in tile showers and big double walk-in closets and then there's three bedrooms upstairs and some of the units have two bathrooms upstairs some of them just have one that was all um, optional each of these also has a large screen porch uh, two of the units customized these into family rooms and didn't make them screen porches but we had wood burning fireplaces big stone chimneys on the exterior as well as wood burning fireplace in the main unit or it could be gas that was optional this is what really drew people to the site. This is the Fox River Channel. Um, we found that originally had planned on a, a large shrub or hedge to kind of give privacy and every owner to a tee told us not to do that um, because they really enjoyed the activity on the trail and the view of the water. Uh, we ha have had some water problems on the other side of the trail with the high water for the last couple of years. So we are still working on some landscaping now that the water level is going down here. So that's still in the process of being beautified here. Um, but if you take a look down, I guess maybe Jason show them some of the exterior features of the condominiums. We've got standing seam metal roofs, stone chimneys, um, lots of steep gables, and then some cedar uh, brackets and corbels that kind of complement the thing. And what we really were looking to do here was create a low maintenance community or neighborhood that gave people the opportunity to have a nice home with the things they want in it in an area that was convenient for shopping and recreation. And um, we just found there was a market we never anticipated that people were willing to pay a higher dollar to give up their homes that they raise their kids in. We do have some multiple people that are still working. Some are raising kids in here. I myself have one still at home and there's another family that's got three kids at home. So we have a, a nice blend in the community. Um, so I guess that's the main thing I'd have to say. Great. Well, we don't believe that, you know, that we're looking to do an exact repeat of, of what uh, Bob and his team have done here at Pelican Landing. We wanted to communicate the image of, of the quality and the lifestyle that we we're able to develop and, and deliver to customers and also uh, assure you that that there is, in fact, demand for this product in the marketplace. Uh, you know, as evidenced by, you know, Bob selling out this project before it was even completed. Well, our project may not be uh, as as aggressive as perhaps some of the uh, the others that were presented today from an overall density. Uh, you know, we believe that there's still tremendous uh, pent up demand in the marketplace for, uh, I, I guess, a maintenance free lifestyle in an ownership format and one that can be developed uh, very purposeful and in the boutique setting with a, you know, with a targeted client in mind. You know, again, we're not trying to be all things to all people. You know, we're trying to hit a price point, uh, you know, and a very small subset of the marketplace. And we believe that. Uh, 30 units in, in in this price point bracket on a portion of this site is achievable and executable in today's marketplace. With that, we would uh, you know, welcome any uh, questions that that any of the members of the RDA or anybody else might have. Hey Jason, Tom Belcher here. Um, I used to finance a lot of residential condos, spec buildings and projects. How is your price point going to change much with the uh, lumber prices, steel prices, subcontractor uh, sparsity, all the all the challenges you guys are facing? Um, you know, that, that's a great question. That's a great question, Tom. Uh, you know, certainly the market's uh, uh, a little crazy and a little frothy right now. Uh, you know, we're we're battling through some price increases on on a couple of projects right now. However, 
uh, you know, certainly this is not anything that's a surprise to, to today's home buyer. And they understand right. that these costs need to be passed through to the ultimate consumer or buyer of the product. And I believe it's more a situation where it's Sorry, you know, back on, on you know, TV here <laughs> where you know, communication becomes more and more important and and just bringing those issues up up front and and telling people where we are today and what's happening and it'll force us to move a little bit quicker in circumstances and but people are accepting these cost increases and are moving forward with projects. And Bob, you can probably attest to that as well. It's definitely a fluid situation right now. And um, everybody is concerned about it, but everything we're talking to and the, the experts I'm talking to thinks that we are going to hit a leveling point and hopefully scale back a little bit. Um, by the time that this project starts scratching dirt, hopefully I don't see things going down dramatically from where they are, but I think things will have leveled off and hopefully receding a little bit. I, I did read where lumber futures actually went down uh, today or yesterday, so maybe that's took the sign of a, a top. 40% 40, 40 today, yeah, um, but, so. but that's probably not going to hit the lumber yards for a no. while. Yeah, uh, right now we have a crunch. Um, there's the, still the can Canadian tariffs, which is a problem. And then right. Canada's largely shut down for COVID. And so the, the plants that make all the things aren't there. And there's unprecedented demand right now. So it's kind of a perfect storm. So another, lot, quick, another quick question. Uh, how do you know Grant Schwab and, and Megan Lang? You're, you're so we were actually, here. so we were working with, uh, with Grant on, on his site uh, on the Morgan district a little bit farther yeah. uh, east. And we were going to make a proposal on a portion of his land and we were working with him for a couple of months and we actually had Grant and Megan up here to look to walk through the project that we just showed you today. And and they had indicated an interest in working with us on a condominium project initially on their site, but uh, they would, you know, would like to work with us on the on on the sawdust district now that they have alternative uh, I guess plans for their site. I'm yeah, also and that was and that was my follow up is that boat works section of their site. Um, as good or better than this site? Obviously, you, you think not. But um, what's uh, your opinion? I, I think that there's I, I think that there's um, positives and drawbacks to, to both. Sure. Um, you know, I like the fact that this site is a little bit closer to the lake and perhaps uh, uh, you know pre presents a little bit more of a view corridor. Obviously, the railroad bridge presents a little bit of challenges, particularly uh, with some of the noise that's there. Uh, you know, the, the boat work site is, is nice in, in that it's quiet and that it's quaint. Uh, but it also, uh, you, you know, is, is certainly, you know, tucked in behind a pocket of, uh, you know, certainly a, a little, uh, you know, more modest housing and, and the path in there maybe is a little less direct. The cross river view is superior at this site as well. Oh, right. And, and, and in, in my experience, you know, a lot of these decisions are about lifestyle. And we believe that the sawdust site, you know, might tend to offer a little bit more lifestyle from a walkability standpoint. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Do other um, RDA members, or if we have any council members left, I'm not sure, um, <laughs> have any other questions? Because I, I was going to suggest that if if we don't. Um, that we perhaps consider taking a short recess. Um, I, I imagine we may want to have a, a bit of a conversation uh, for for giving direction to staff. And uh, certainly, thank you, Mr. Uh, Tedic, um, and your partner there for a, a creative presentation. <laughs> thank you. Have a great night. Thanks, Appreciate your thanks time. for going last. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks for putting us on the agenda last. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. We'll see you. Bye bye. Take care. Uh, how are folks feeling about taking a short recess? Or would you like to just move on? I'm good to move on. Just soon move on. Yeah. Move on. Okay. All right. We will do that. Can we kick everybody else off? No, it's still an open no, this meeting. Is, yeah, this oh, okay. is still a public meeting. This is not okay. closed session. Okay. All right. So, uh, RDA discussion, and uh, I, I think staff is looking for 
some direction uh, for next steps on this. Well, looking at the plan, um, you know, one of the things was having um, mixed use and multiple options. So, so did that disqualify anybody? Because the proposal was asking for mixed use and um, multi, I don't remember the exact wording, but multifamily options. If you're talking about, are you talking about the last presentation with Mr. Tadich and Mr. Grabowski? Right, I love the proposal, but does would that, because they didn't meet the, the request, would that eliminate them? Or can we still consider them is my question. I think you can still consider them because they certainly left the area along Main Street and 9th for other uses, other developments. They're only proposing the area that they included in their proposal, which was okay, okay. along the Fox River. The RDA could split the project and say this would go to developer A and this could go to developer B if you, if you would want to look at it that way. Okay. I wanted to know what options we had, yeah. I think you have every option available that you could think of right now still. Well, I just like to again um, point out how useful this matrix is. And for those of you who um, may not have gotten the printed out version, I found it very helpful to um, reflect back and forth between the RFP, um, the different proposals and this matrix and making my notes and um, you know, that helped me kind of focus in on a couple. I've had, um, I, I read the, the email that we received from Mr. Pollock. And then I also had somebody approach me at another meeting I was at to express their interest in high end condos. Um, and so I just wanted to share that information that now we've. I have personally heard from two different people about the high end, the need for, or the, but not necessarily the need, but the want for high end condos. Um, just wanted to share that with the group. Um, so I'll just keep talking here. Um, I liked the proposal, and I'm trying to remember which one it was that allowed for um, more public access. I guess it was Red Earth. Uh, T Wall may have also, too. Um, they had more. Uh, public access and a pedestrian walkway to the river walk. And then I wasn't quite sure about the city owned park that they were going to um, propose. But, you know, I'm, I'm con concerned that if we have this area and no actual parkland for for the residents to enjoy, um, that would be an issue. So I think it was the first one, T-Wall, that had the nice courtyard and then Red Earth that had the um, public access that I liked. One of them reminded me of a city within a city in a sense. Um, I like the 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 um, chats proposal. Um, I thought it was a nice use of condos and then multifamily. Um, and I'm trying to remember. And Alexander Bishop, they have a good uh, reputation in the city as far as building. What I failed to ask, ask them though was whether what their occupancy rates are right now. And I'm done. Thank you, Sue. Can I can I I'd like to ask a question, Jason Lasky speaking. Um, and that is, are we really looking to go forward with a option process? So to award an option at the June meeting for a predefined length of time to continue diligence to to a particular development to continue diligence on the site. And then after that period, discuss the term of purchase or have that term of purchase described in the contract as well. I would say that at some point you'll need to decide who the developer should be, but then you could go into a, to close session to negotiate terms regarding that development agreement and I think that would eventually involve the city council because I think the development agreement 
would probably be a three party agreement again with the developer, the RDA and the council, just like we did with the Marion Road developments, because the council's action on TIF districts or any kind of financial assistance or grants would be channeled through the council. Uh, whereas the RDA is responsible for disposing of the land or selling the land at the, for the best possible purchase or purpose and purchase price. Uh, so the, there's a there's a couple of things that I think staff still needs to follow up on before we could make that decision. I'd suggest that I'd want to look more into the remediation costs for the different proposals because every proposal uh, was predicated on the city or the RDA providing them a clean slate. Uh, those different alternatives will cost a different amount of money depending on their proposal. I love seeing the underground parking, but underground parking does drive up the cost of remediation. I can tell you that from Marion Road experience. And then the follow up to the, that is that's one of the costs that I want to figure into some kind of TIF PAYGO calculation so that we can get a good idea as to if they're all proposing a TIF, how, how much value they'd be creating, uh, how quickly we could pay off the ask that they've made regarding the TIF, how much we need for remediation or any other public infrastructure improvement like Ninth Avenue or the Riverwalk or anything else and probably put that package together prior to the June meeting. So you'll have a little more information on the financial side. We really didn't touch too much on that tonight. And that's that's the basis for the negotiations, I guess, is what I was leading back to. Hi, this is Archie Stam. I just got a quick question for you, Mr. Davis, and that is about the uh can we actually put all these boat slips out on the river? Is the DNR all right with that? Uh, the city would have to provide uh, riparian ownership to the developers so that they could qualify for those boat slips. And I believe back in 2005 or six, when the city was developing the Fox River Corridor plan, that was an eligible location for Doc slips i hate to call on miss brant one more time but <laughs> do you recall what the the discussion with dnr has been regarding the boat slips to this point um the last conversation i recall was that um if the city were considering putting in any more boat do docks along the fox river corridor they would not support it but private developers could uh, request that permit for those uh, dock constructions. So private developers could still do it, but the city would not. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now that could change, you know, just based on different staff and so forth, but that was the last discussion we had and that, and that was several years ago, so. And, and can I just ask, um, I drove down there today and, and driven down there numerous times, but can somebody remind me, where does the seawall start? Does the seawall start at Pioneer Island or does the seawall start closer to the Main Street Bridge? I was just gonna go on Google Earth and see. Um, and while you're while you're looking at that, uh, kind of a, a a kind of a broader question. Um, there's a lot of um, discussion here about the connection and extension of downtown with, you know, what could be here, um, and and I don't know if Mr. Davis, this is going to put you on the spot. Do we know, or maybe Mr. Roloff, I saw is is on whether or not the main street bridge you know the the pedestrian and biking can be really dicey there uh that connection is is there what does it look like in our future for uh main street bridge um uh replacement or restructuring let me answer the seawall one question because i think i can handle that one uh, okay. our immediate plans right now is the the seawall along pioneer drive from main street over to the railroad tracks uh, would be remain relatively unchanged. We'd have some fishing uh, areas that would come off the trail so we could still fish there. 
but we were not planning on building a new seawall or installing new riprap. We were trying to minimize those costs and we will do whatever the DNR requires in the permit, but that's not what we were proposing was any kind of new establishment of a seawall because that is a very expensive endeavor when it comes to river walk development. I, and I thought the mayor's question had to do with, is there a seawall there? And, and I think the answer is there's not. Yeah, there's not a seawall there now, and it's not intended right. to be that for all the reasons Mr. Davis identified. Right. Right. Okay. As, as far as the bridge, it's interesting because I've had uh, questions from council members on consecutive days now about a uh, bridge uh, status. The next bridge to be done is the Jackson Street Bridge, and that's still several years down the road. You may recall that was deferred a few years ago by the DOT. ARPA may speed that up. Uh, we shall see. Main Street is still... Um, a ways away before that's going to be done. So the imperfection in the trail system is that uh, crossing the river at Main Street will be difficult. The idea, I mean, certainly people can, yeah, we'd encourage them to to walk their bike across because it is very narrow at that point. Otherwise, I think we would encourage them to move over to Jackson Street where there's a little more uh, accommodations. And as far as the Pioneer Drive Riverwalk, we have done preliminary design for that connection there at Main Street, and we would improve that intersection so that people could safely cross Main Street uh, with pedestrian uh, signals and an improved, uh, I guess, pedestrian uh, safe area, uh, kind of like where the raised median is for the turn lane, uh, so we could improve the safety a little bit but it wouldn't be nearly as good as an underpass on the on a on a bridge i knew darlene was going to raise her hand because she's been working on this for so long so she does have some some good knowledge and yeah i'll give her a shout out we're going to miss her too because this is the type <laughs> of stuff darlene does all the time and it's yeah. it's welcomed <laughs> well i just wanted to make another point on the question about the boat docks uh because if the city installs them, they have to remain as public docking. They cannot be leased, rented, or anything. They have to remain as public docking. If a developer constructs them and has riparian property owner rights, then they can be used privately. So that's one of the qualifications. And I think that was the DNR's biggest objection is because we have a large quantity of uh, public docks already along the um, Fox River corridor. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that, so. I see Sue's had her hand up for a bit here. Well, so Darlene, maybe you could ask me, um, and I apologize, I keep forgetting to call you Mr. and Mrs. Gordon, you know, so I just know you as Darlene and Alan. <laughs> but could you share with me, um, um, if they put the docks in, if the developer puts the docks in, do they own the land or just the docks? They would have to own the docks and the riparian rights to those docks. So there would have to right be some kind of. Uh, They'd have to own some type of land. So we would have to they? sell the land adjacent to the water, which is the riparian rights. So um, there would have to be some kind of land sale of the. Um, a separation of the strip between the river walk and the water that would be sold to the developer. But then the river walk would still remain public. Correct. Okay. So, as I understand it, um, there, there are 2 other dates that were in the RFP that that may also be considered additional proposals. Um, Unless recommendation is made to um, option these to one of these proposals, is that is that the process? Yes, uh, I I'd use an analogy in that this this is like a help wanted ad, and this position is open until filled, and we have five applicants in front of you. You could reject all five of them and hope another applicant comes in the door the next day who would be do a better job. So. And it does appear it does appear that um, based on our our RFP also that um, there, there 
there's not necessarily like the T wall was really impressive, right? But there was no uh, there were no condos or, or low density mixed in with the higher density and and then you know it seemed like um, the River North group you know hit like all the boxes on our on our matrix. But one of the things I think is Mr. Lyons still here. Um, I don't know if you or, or Mr. Davis want want to talk a little bit about the um, the RMU and the RFO and how that shakes out with the, the density um, and desires along with the master plan and, and what was presented tonight. Yes, Mr. Lyons is here. Mr. Lyons has reviewed all the proposals and uh, you can speak for yourself. Yeah, uh, so in terms of the both the zoning ordinance, the underlying RMU zoning district, that is a riverfront mixed use district um, it has special design standards that go with it. Um, our anticipation is looking at all of these type of proposals or any future proposals uh, you may consider that this is an area that's likely going to need a plan development. When we did the Sawdust District Master Plan, we fully understood that this was going to be a unique area and plan developments were the appropriate way to handle whatever may come forward. Now, when you look at the Sawdust District Master Plan for this area, it was looking at a very high density development uh, with that mixed use aspect. So it was looking for that combination of adding rooftops into the area along with commercial business to make it a thriving Main Street type feel. Um, and the underlying zone district kind of matches that. The RMU is, is really after the same uh, type of development for this area. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion in, in the Sawdust District Plan about utilization of the river, the riverfront, the views that are associated with that, and how those play into creating a destination type of atmosphere for the Sawdust District. Thank you. I, I got a little uh, circular in, in, in looking at item number four in the RFP where it was referencing the RMU permitting the low density, but it didn't necessarily say we were requiring that um, as part of this. Okay, thank you. I, I also want to just make a point that um, trying to put everything all in one box is, is fine, but be reminded that we have so much developable property on this river that there are so much opportunity, I think, to get everything satisfied that the city wants and everybody wants. It may not all happen in one development, and that's okay. Good point. Very good point. So staff is looking for direction specifically about next steps. I'd want to make sure that we have all the available information you'd like uh, before you select a proposal or want to go into closed session to negotiate a potential development agreement or terms for a purchase. And, and Mr. Belter, um, maybe you or others here um, on, on the uh, RDA can help me understand this a little more. Um, there was a question about um, the strength of a structure with three different LLCs. Um, I, I don't recall who asked that question. Um, and, and, and I believe there's another question about who would be responsible out of those three LLCs. And, and maybe staff could even speak to this too, but I'm just wondering about that. You've answered yes, the question. And, um... It's a good it's a good point as if I was the banker I'd be very very attentive to that because I need a decision maker how the structure is who guarantees it what the global cash flow is how it all meshes together for the development I, I kind of liked the three-pronged approach but um, that, that's probably the least of my worries uh, you know, proposals uh, to our macro question I, I really am not ready to pick one or two or three or four, or really I liked all five of the proposals. Um, I'm thinking maybe we should absorb what we heard 
Now we can go back through the matrix that Kelly prepped, and thank you, Kelly, and kind of make some decisions on our own. I do have questions really for everybody now that I've, now that I've heard them, and maybe Alan and, and Kelly can answer those, or maybe Mark can weigh in. And then there should be some way for us to vote or get a final two or three of the developers in person. You know, personally, I don't like Approving a twenty-five or forty million dollar project and not looking people eye to eye, I just said I don't like to work like that. So maybe if we could refine our, our knowledge base on each project with some follow-up questions to through Kelly, maybe, and then either vote by email or have have. I'm not sure if we're allowed to do that for for city rules, but um, I'm not ready to pick anybody today. I don't know if anybody else is. Madam Mayor. No, you're I was oh I was only gonna Madam Mayor, I was only gonna comment on the first part of your question. Um and I think Mr. Belter kind of took care of that already, but when we get into development agreement mode, that's when we get into the details of, you know, you got three LLCs and how do you do that? That's why we have a, uh, an attorney who uh, will work with us on a development agreement because uh, you, it was a good question to point out and uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. But uh, it's something to think about. And we staff noticed that, that there were three LLCs and it's like that makes it a little, uh, little more challenging, but not impossible. Right. So at this point, then, when we have our special meeting scheduled uh, for the 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 sixteenth, at would we look at doing a closed session um, prior to that special meeting? We certainly could if there were uh, we meet the criteria for a closed session and that's typically negotiations or strategy for negotiations with a developer and you've got five development proposals that you could in theory start negotiating uh, uh, deliberations on. And I would assume any question that an RDA member would raise could potentially impact negotiations so i and i i will you know ask staff to double and triple check with the city attorney but i think you have every right to go into closed session uh on this issue uh at least at this point sort of using alan's analogy if if you're applying for a position you you still talk about the rel uh, the various applicants uh uh in closed session out of respect for them Well, thank you for those suggestions of uh, digesting and absorbing uh, and, and, and folks uh, going back to their matrix and, and uh, coming back in person, which we just voted earlier to do at our next meeting after the joint workshop. Mm -hmm. um, do others have a desire, a strong desire to do something otherwise? I mean, if anybody's ready to advance, if, if, if we all have strong opinions on a winning proposal, that's, you know, I'm just one guy here, so um, that's okay too. But I, I just think there's so much to absorb in the last two hours of discussion. I just know I'm not ready to, to pick a winner. Well, I don't think that staff is asking us to make a selection tonight, but just let them know what, what we'd like to do next. That's it. Are we okay on timing for that, Alan? If we if we uh, have a special session on the 16th of June, is that I mean, nobody's going to start construction in August, so yes, uh, the 16th of June was the earliest we could get a quorum put together and get the additional information I think the RDA needs to have before they finish their deliberations. So I think that's reasonable and. Uh, we'd soon follow up with uh, council with a presentation to council regarding a TIF district. 
and certainly there'd be some kind of workshop with the plan commission because this is this is just the first step of many steps that would need to be uh, done uh, to be completed even to get to the point of actually having a development agreement signed. Uh, typically, we're going to have some kind of general development plan approved by plan commission. We're going to have a development agreement. We, we're probably going to have a TIF plan and a joint review board review and a, uh, that whole process. So if there's a lot of convergent paths that would need to come together, uh, and this is just one of them, but this is the first one, the most important one. Alan, do you want a recommendation from us on the 16th? Proceed uh, with a single with a single one of the proposals. Uh, it's not re certainly not required, uh, but it would accelerate the process for the developers. Okay. Do so we know if oh, if anybody did? I'm sorry, Sue. Go ahead. No, you go. You go ahead. That's fine. So, are you? If if uh, an RDA member tonight is you know, ready to ask to go back and revisit, let's say two out of the five. Is is that a, a, a preference that we can convey to you beyond tonight? I believe you can, and I would probably coordinate that with the city attorney's office to make sure we're uh, in compliance with city and state uh closed session but that's picking the winners and losers uh regarding negotiations that's right up the alley for a closed session so you're 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 leading me to the point where the 16th will probably include a closed session not just the open session for public comment and the other follow-up that uh we wanted to, to contribute to the conversation regarding remediation costs or the tiff projections I guess my question was going to be, have, is there, um, if, if, if we were to choose one, and let's, I'm just going to use a hypothetical. If we were to choose, choose um, the Tati um, proposal, and we still have that extra parcel of land left, okay, um, do we know of anybody who would be interested in just developing that little parcel? Would there be any of the other four who would say, oh, yeah, that's still enough of a project we're interested. We did not solicit for that. That would be a follow up. Uh, conversation, at least, if not a request for a proposal for that area, would, would we have to do a separate request? Mm. See, I just don't know all the rules here. If, if, yeah. if they're only proposing to use a portion of the, the land that we Put the proposal out for is that then become a new proposal for the rest of the land if we were to choose them by chance I, and i'm and not mayor. leaning one way or the yes. other but yes i would say i think those are excellent questions for a closed session i would i would reserve that to closed session i think that that and yes to all of the above i mean any variation on sue's question they're all legitimate questions and we can talk about that, but I would suggest doing it in closed session so that your uh, uh, negotiating strategy is uh, preserved for your for yours and the city's benefit. Okay, and, and I don't mean to be showing preference in my discussion. It's just I have this question of how does it all fit together? And, and, and there, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that Kelly put in that matrix that you could look at. So. Uh, uh, I appreciate Kelly's work on that matrix as well, because it makes it, it, you're on this RDA board for a reason, and it's not because it's easy. <laughs> and yeah. This is one of those times. So um, I guess, Alan, you know, I would have this request, and it relates to what Sue's asking. Going into that closed session, can you let us know, or can, can either you or Ms. Nyforth find out if, that parcel that she referenced was removed from the equation or given an option by itself uh, to, for example, Tedic, does that make it a deal breaker for any of the other proposals? I, I, you know, I don't know if it's possible to find that out going in or not. 
Mm -hmm. I'd echo Mr. Rowe's uh, comment that uh, when you start talking about this, it almost sounds like you're negotiating. A, a uh, okay. That's, I, I'm pretty darn sure you can go into closed session and negotiate a development agreement, and that would be one of the criteria I'd be looking at. So. Oh, okay. okay, so I think we've had a couple of hints that we're stretching the boundaries here. Um, so um, I don't want to do anything inappropriate. This is what I'm going to miss about Miss Brent. She used to kick me under the table. <laughs> Can't do that virtually right now anyway. Yeah. Do we need do we need to um like formally uh propose something here or not? Well, uh, since we're still in workshop. Time? Since we're in workshop, we're not technically oh, voting on anything. We're just giving direction to staff. But go ahead, Mr. Um Lasky. No, that's it. I just agree that uh doing the closed session with the meeting on the 15th is perfect. And I think that it'll be I mean, I'm looking forward to it. And I would, I would just uh, end by saying if there's anything that comes up between now and the June 16th meeting, if you could let us know, we could still try to get some additional information or do some research uh, so that we can give you uh, as complete information as we can there on the 16th. I would like um, an open forum for questions if because um, I have some of all five proposals. If I would forward those through Kelly and then maybe we collect that Q and A before our meeting on the sixteenth, so we all kind of knew what what we were thinking about. Is that okay, Kelly? And would that be able to be added into the matrix? Because you know how much I love it. <laughs> the matrix. <laughs> I'm a very visual person, and that just helps me. So, um, yeah. Sure, if um, if the um, RDA members have questions for all five developers, we can certainly uh, reach out to them and get their feedback and then include it, um, you know, create an updated matrix. Okay. And um, I did I did email during the meeting um, the meeting packet and city did ask some initial questions to the developers that, you know, we were curious about. So take a look at those materials I did send um, the meeting packet just to make sure some of your questions weren't already answered from that. Can I just confirm with everybody that you all got that packet and, yeah. and those attachments? Okay. If anybody did not, you know, please make contact with Kelly. Yeah, it right. appears that the link to the RDA members might have been broken. The link to council, I think, was still um, good. So I did resend everything um, besides just the electronic versions of the proposals. But if anybody would like that, I can send um, a link for that. Great. All right, are we good with adjourning then for this evening? We do need an adjournment and I do need to do a roll call. Oh, on the workshop? Okay, my apologies. If you are ready to adjourn too. Just want to make sure nobody forgets that. <laughs> I'll make, I'll a, make motion. a motion to adjourn. Yeah. So I have a motion by Mr. Stam and I think a second by Mr. Belter. Yes. Okay. Um, Birmingham. Hints. Mr. Hints is still I here. We, I think we lost Mr. Hints. Okay. Um, Sam. Aye. Lasky. Aye. Tonic. Aye. Belter. Aye. Palmieri. Aye. And I don't believe we have any more counselors left. So. I will not go through their um, through their roll call. So I think uh, just if if I could just ask one more uh, housekeeping question for that next um, RDA special meeting. That would be I think Mr. Davis indicated earlier there there were folks who wanted to watch this or weigh in or comment. Um, that would be an open session. The opportunity. Uh, for uh, public comment or, or participation on that, correct? 
Yes, we'll have a specific line item on the agenda for additional public comment. In open all right in open session. Okay, just wanted to confirm that. Yep. All right, very good. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Yep. Bye. Good. <laughs> <laughs>